Hello, and welcome to the Sailing and Cruising the East Coast of the United States podcast. I'm Bela Musitz. Wait, Bela, today I think it actually should be called Sailing and Cruising Latin America. Okay, so <laughs> you're right. It's sailing and cruising Latin America with Bela and I'm Mike Wasserman. Okay, take it away, Bela. <laughs> okay, you're absolutely right, Mike. This is not about North America, although they started and finished in in the East Coast of the United States. Uh, so anyway, uh, this podcast is about sailing and cruising Latin America. Uh, this particular episode, and today's guest is Stephen Ladd. Right, this guy is remarkable. He recently wrote a book entitled. The Five-Year Voyage, Exploring Latin American Coasts and Rivers. And it's one heck of an adventure on a small sailboat. Yeah, and a small ultralight sailboat at that, with, for the first part of the journey, no motor. I mean, this story is so amazing. And I'm really excited that you that you found Stephen and he's on the podcast. I teach a lot of students who come from Latin America, and it's really one part of the world that I have not explored um, so I was excited to get the book and to read the book, and uh, and I'm really excited to hear about your conversation. I can't imagine taking my first trip to Latin America this way, um, but I don't want to give the story away. So I think let's jump right to it, Bela, and get to your interview with Stephen Ladd. Sounds good, Mike. Let's go. Welcome, podcast listeners. Uh, today I have a really super guest uh, that we're going to interview for the podcast. It is Stephen Ladd. And Stephen sailed on a very small boat, leaving Florida and down through Latin America. It was a five-year adventure uh, that he documented in his book, The Five-Year Voyage. So uh, we're going to talk a little, bit, a little bit about his trip and the book as well. Welcome to the podcast, Stephen. Oh, thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah. So, Stephen, I always uh, like to think about these, these, how people make decisions, Right. So was this one of those things where, you know, you're in the shower in the morning and you said, you know what, I'm going to go build a boat and sail to parts that people normally don't sail to? Or is it much or was it much more of an evolving process for you? The latter, it did evolve, although there is a touch of predestination to it as well, which probably sounds kind of mysterious, but it, it evolved, I think is the main answer. Yeah. So for those folks who haven't read the book, uh, could just take us through this, you know, kind of the, the route of the voyage briefly, kind of where you went. From the um, east coast of Florida on the Gulf of Mexico down to the Keys, crossed to Cuba, west along the north coast of Cuba, crossed the Yucatan Channel to Mexico, followed the the Mayan coast, that is the Caribbean coast of Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, into the trade winds going east along the coast of Honduras, <clears throat> then going around Cabo Gracias de Dios and south through the other Central American countries to Panama. And that part of the trip, which was about two years, was without a motor, just rowing and sailing. And then we got a two-horse you know, um, Honda, the two horse power uh, Honda outboard. And, and because we are then going against the trade winds for 1500 miles along the coast of Colombia and Venezuela, <clears throat> then the first of 13 transports occurred where we um, got onto the a tributary of the Orinoco. And then we went up the Orinoco motoring and sometimes sailing, but mostly motoring. And we found at the headwaters of the Amazon a mysterious connector called the Casiquiare, which is a bifurcation or a distributary where one river divides in two, the two parts go into totally different watersheds. So you're able to continue sailing right continuously to a different uh, river system, that one being the Amazon. So we came in the Amazon by its back door into first the Rio Negro, then the main stem of the Amazon. And then, so that was kind of going over a hump, the, the hump being the high ground between the Orinoco Basin and the Amazon Basin. But now we did that again for a different hump. We went south, that is upstream on the Madeira, another major tributary of the Amazon. Um, and then we did a portage across its high waters to the beginning of the river on the other side, which is the Paraguay. 
there's a country by that name, of course. So we were on Paraguay, we followed it, and then it flowed into the Paraná, and then it flows into the Atlantic Ocean at, at Buenos Aires. And that's the first half of the trip, basically. I, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll wait to explain the rest. Yeah, wow, what an adventure. And, and you did this in, in what type of uh, vessel? A sea pearl. A sea pearl is a 21-foot, lightweight, fiberglass <clears throat> sailboat um, made in the United States. And it's a it's rather unusual design. It's uh, unusually light um, and um, narrow and shallow drafted. It draws only six or seven inches of water. So it was sort of intended for the shallow waters around, you know, the Florida Keys and so forth. It has lee boards. Its rig is a uh, catch with a um, no no standing rig. So it's a freestanding catch rig with an unusual reefing system. We had a, a, a sliding seat rowing station in it that was integral to the whole process. Uh, that was set up in the uh, cockpit, but then taken down when you're not rowing. And um, like I say, for the latter three years of the voyage, we had a two-horse uh, Honda motor as well. Yeah. Now, uh, you have said several times, we. So who who, who is the we on this uh, adventure? Right. Um, it's my wife, uh, Virginia. She was not yet my wife. My first book, Three Years in a 12-Foot Boat, that was just myself, but then... Jenny and I met, and um, she she shared my sense of adventure, and she was not at all a reluctant participant. She was a 100% right beside me participant, and never never lost the gusto, and was um, totally enamored of the whole process. Yeah, yeah, wow, that's that's unbelievable. And uh, so, what type of uh, equipment, I'll say, did you have did you have on the boat? Yeah, well, a kind of a, a rule of thumb is that the type of equipment you use is very simple and light, like what you might use backpacking. In fact, my um, my stove, my white gas stove, is my backpacking stove. You're able to carry more things than you would backpacking, but it's that feeling of simplicity. We, we had, of course, no refrigeration, no communication equipment other than a VHF radio. We... <clears throat> We would get cell phones in particular countries as necessary to just take care of daily business in those countries. But we generally had no way to communicate with the outside world underway. We, we used the cyber cafes that one can find throughout Latin America in the cities for our planning and our communications like in between you know, legs of the trip. Yeah. So if we're yeah. in a certain city. We would do we would do a lot of planning there. We would we actually got into a, a system since since the rivers of South America do not have navigational charts, they're not finely mapped. We did the mapping ourselves using Google Earth and other attachments to that program, whereby we were able to click in with a mouse on the screen to create the outlines of the rivers, the islands, the towns, and so forth. We're able to transfer that digital information of those lines as a map onto our handheld GPS. Our GPS was just a handheld GPS, and, yeah. and it, we had to mount it to to the the mizzenmast, which was right in front of us at the, at the steering station. Yeah, and and what do you use for for power? I mean, you have some a few things there that are electronic, uh, right? Just the batteries. We had, uh, and we had that is we tried to. For example, use a, we, the, the boat has no lighting system. We just always wear headlamps. And <clears throat> the little things, you know, of your life, to the extent that they can be battery out, but that's out of upgraded, that's the best. But we also had a, a small solar panel, just about, um, I guess it was 18 inches by 24 inches. And that powered our laptop. Laptop, we just had one. And, of course, we needed a laptop. We used it a lot. And it powered, mm, what else did it power? One or two other things, but not of a very significant nature. But we did need, need those things. And, and later on, we were able, so we had, um, as a battery, we just had, we didn't have like a car battery or a big battery. We had a little um, emergency backup system battery that's about as big as 
four packs of cigarettes put together. And um, that was enough juice storage to even run a very small, very economical fan at night in, in hot weather in yeah. the cabin. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Wow. And when you were giving us the description of, of your route there, you, you part of this was done without a motor, right? So you were... You were either rowing or the wind was taking you or the tide and currents were taking you. That was, that was your options there. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, um, that was fine except for on the coast of Honduras. It, it was pretty tedious on the coast of Honduras. So straight into the trade winds all the time and very few natural harbors. So it was difficult to get to that next, that next port sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so what what was sort of the the impetus for getting getting the getting the motor, and how did you buy fuel for that, et cetera? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, when we got down to like I said, it, it sort of evolved. We, but first we were just going to go to the, the coast of Mexico and in Belize, but then we liked it so well we continued to Panama, and then at that point we decided what we're going to do next to a large extent, which was to go east along the south shore of the Caribbean Sea, Caribbean Sea or the north coast of Colombia and Venezuela. Now that is directly under the trade winds and it's it's a rough sea and yeah. uh, so we needed we needed power for that. Yeah. It was almost it was mostly power and straight straight into the waves. Yeah. And that was so that was rather tedious and unpleasant. I mean, you're just pounding and pounding. You're you're trying to get you're trying to get someplace so as to <laughs> get to another phase of the voyage and when we got to a place where we could be portaged to a <clears throat> to a tributary of the Orinoco we took that opportunity yeah so one of the things I'm always curious about you know when when most people think about sailing and we think about you know going to Bahamas uh, or you know v- the British Virgin Islands etc and there's a lot of infrastructure there there's you know ATMs that you can get money you can buy your cell cards for your cell phone. Uh, you can get fuel. You can get all those types of things. But you were in a bunch of places that are pretty remote. So how, how did you deal with a, a lot of those types of challenges that we take for granted in our everyday sort of cruising? Yeah, good question. In South America, there are towns, of course, but they're in the Amazon region. They're generally not interconnected. They're a particular town may be substantial in size. It might have 50,000 people or Manaus has 1.5 million, but there's no roads connecting them together. And um, so they'll, you'll see a city with cars, but those cars can only run around the, the city streets. Um, and in between, there's hundreds of miles of just jungle, very, very low population. But we were able to carry enough food, water, fuel, um, for typically 10 days. 10 days was, would not be a difficult stretch of time. And so, for example, water, we actually, the number one source of water was municipal water supplies in cities where that is possible. And then the second biggest source of water was bottled water, when you can get a five gallon fill up on a, on a bottle, for example. And food was just normal food bought in stores, prepared with our little stove and our um, pressure cooker. We had a very kind of a miniature pressure cooker to uh, make the fuel last longer. Now, the fuel is <clears throat> the fuel for the motor would use any automotive fuel, but the the white gas stove we had a constant battle there. Stoves, the, there is no good solution for a stove that you can use anywhere in the bush. There simply does not exist a stove that ha- that uses fuel that you can get anywhere. And this was particularly the case with white gas. So it's it's great when you have white gas, but that's usually aviation fuel. And there's all these, every country has their own blend, sometimes extremely high in ethanol. And uh, so it's a constant battle with that still. We're yeah. cleaning it all the time. But there was never any better solution we found. Yeah, so you actually cut out there a little bit, Steve, Stephen, while you were talking about the white gas challenges uh, so could you could you just say that again because I think it's an important point, but but uh, the 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 line here cut out. Okay. Yeah, in in South America, we just used various 
brands of automotive fuel. We even tried diesel. We tried aviation fuel. They all have major problems where the the <clears throat> the ethanol absorbs too much water, and uh, you're always getting you're all, you're having to clean clean the stove every other time you use it. So we we never found a good solution to that. But we, we were always able to cook our food. Yeah, yeah. And and how did you do most of your provisioning? Uh, was it just as one would expect? You go to what we in this country call farmers markets, <laughs> uh, or or grocery stores. Every port and every town has its, you know, situation of stores or markets. So every one, of course, is a place where you haven't been to before, and you have to decide where there is a safe place to leave your boats. Mm, yeah. Maybe you can find a map. You want to find where there's stores. You want to find where there's water. You want to find where there's cyber cafe. You've got a long list, and you just beat your head against that wall for that port and then you do it again in the next, you know, a week later when you come to the next town. Yeah. But, you know, they might, it, it ranges, it runs the gamut from uh, <clears throat> a very tiny village to the city of Manaus. There's, there's not a lot of generality to it. And uh, what about the language? Uh, is, is Spanish the primary method for communication down that part of the world? Spanish is, except in Brazil, and <clears throat> so we, we in particular, I, particularly I, was already competent in Spanish. We had to um, learn Portuguese. We spent a couple of years in Brazil, and um, so we took Rosetta Stone. We were able to, you know, have that on our laptop, and we just schooled ourselves in, in Portuguese, and we're always able to get by. Yeah. We're conversational enough to totally get our needs met and, and make friends. Yeah. Oh, very nice. Uh, what, what were, uh, some of the, Oh, we should finish the route. I, I, I don't think you, you took us through the, the whole route. Right. So, uh, you, okay. you uh, remind us where you stopped and pick it up from there. Mm-hmm. So we, we took the r- rivers South through kind of through the center of the South American continent, uh, which is sort of an unusual route. We're cutting across, the Amazon water basin from north to south, whereas, of course, the river itself runs from west to east, and then got into the Paraguay River and followed it down to the, it's called the Rio de la Plata. It's the, you could call it a bay or you could call it a short river that's um, connected to the Atlantic Ocean. And so that was the end of that riverine section in in a southward direction. So to go back home, we took a different set of rivers. We took the Uruguay, as in the name of that small country, yeah. and the Upper Paraná, and then some smaller ones, like the Verdao. And then we made a major portage to a major river that you will have never heard of, but it's a big, important river, the Araguaia. And the Araguaia flows 1,500 miles in the northern direction, um, and joins the Amazon. I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit here. It, the Araguay is actually a tributary of the Tocantins, and so we were also on the Tocantins, but I call it all just by one name. I call it the Araguay. And that all joins the Amazon at the mouth of the Amazon. It's really not a tributary of the Amazon. They just come to the ocean in a mouth at the same place. Yeah, yeah. And and then so and then from there, you, you headed back towards... Uh... You headed north towards the United States? Right. Right. We, we had had um, our baby. We, <clears throat> we conceived the baby in Brazil, and then we had it. Well, then we were in Paraguay and Argentina and Uruguay, but when it came time to have the baby, we were again in Brazil. And um, for about six months, we were able to continue the voyage after like a rest of about one month in, a, in an apartment yeah. in the city the Iguazu. That's where the waterfalls are, the famous waterfalls or the Iguazu Falls. That's where we had them. And, and that's that's our son's middle name, it's Iguazu. So we had a little rest up there, not on the boat, um, in, a, in a one-month apartment. And then we got back aboard with the baby and we were able to cruise just fine um, for another six months or so because 
on the river system and just using the motor, you're not able to sail. Um, it's quite safe and sane to putter along with your little motor and um, <clears throat> keep the baby down in the little cabin and uh, wash his cotton diapers and hang them up on the, on the boom. So we have, we have diapers running the full length of the vessel, 21 feet of diapers <laughs> and washcloths that were, and, and they would have to all be dried and replaced three, three times a day. That's how much diapers a kid uses. And um, so we were uh, floating in the laundromat for months on end there. Yeah, that that's that that that's certainly as you describe that, that's certainly a scene I have not seen. I've seen many things yeah. drying from the boom, <laughs> but I, I don't think I've ever seen diapers yeah. drying from a we, boom. We chose to do the environmentally correct thing, which is to use um, old fashioned cotton diapers because sure. there would be no no way to dispose of disposables. Right. We're not gonna save, you know, two weeks worth of dirty diapers and then put them in a the garbage can. Right. Right. <laughs> But that was going up river, and then then a big portage, and then down the Araguay and the Tocantins to to Belén, another big city in the Amazon region, but at the mouth of the Amazon. And there, Ginny and, and the boy had to fly home because there was no way to safely sail with the three of us aboard in the ocean. Um, in the ocean, you've always got capsize hazard. The, the boat is a very <laughs> tippy boat. We we made it less tippy by building in storage and tankage, but it still is tippy and we did capsize. And so they flew home and for five months, I was on my own sailing back, trying to rejoin them. That's out the mouth of the Amazon, then Northwest along the Guyana coast. Those are the countries of French Guyana, Suriname and Guyana, Venezuela, and then the Eastern Caribbean islands. Um, and I made it as far as the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. and I was within, you know, hailing distance while I still had to go through the Turks and Caicos and the Bahamas, which I was looking forward to. That would have been another 1,200 miles of beautiful sailing. But at the eastern tip of the Dominican Republic, I um, lost the boat in a in a surf crossing over a, a bar over a pass into a lagoon. And um, the boat pitch pulled and broke its mass, broke its sails, lost the, the rowing station, the, the, the motor was underwater. All my means of propulsion were knocked out. And I, I could have stuck, stuck it out and stayed there another few months and figure out how to correct all those situations. But in the meantime, I had a family and I missed them. Sure. So, I sold the boat there, and that was the end of the trip. Yeah, there in the Dominican Republic. Yeah, well, I, I'm looking at your book here, and there's a just a wonderful map that s sort of shows your route, leaving Florida uh, and down into South America, and, and all the various different uh, places uh, you described. Do, do you have a a, a a guesstimate on how many miles how many miles all that was? Yeah, we did figure that out to be eighteen thousand miles. <clears throat> we kept the GPS running the whole time, and yeah. we. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, hmm. wow, that's a that's a lot of miles for anybody on any size vessel, and and given the fact that you you, you the two two of you and then three of you on a, on a small small vessel is really incredible. So, have you always sort of had this uh, wanderlust or this you know desire to travel? Has that always been a, a constant theme in in sort of your life? Yeah, but it it requires a little bit of explanation. I. I've been on three major travels that last a year or more, and those occurred. This is just kind of a funny thing. When I mentioned predestination earlier, I don't know how serious to be about that. All I can tell you is the facts, and you can do with it what you want. At age 18, I had a major travel, um, Europe, Asia, and Africa, very traumatic. I was got caught up in a war between Pakistan and India, and I spent a month in a Moroccan prison. And then... At age 36, I went on the three years on a 12-foot boat, and then <clears throat> at, at age 54, I noticed that I'm doing this trip with Jenny. So 18, 36, 54, that's 18 years apart. And um, so that would imply, see, in each case, I kind of had to go, you know? It's like, 
Moby Dick, you know, he has to go down to sea in boats. Yep. Uh, the, the feeling comes upon him. He has no choice. It's an involuntary response. So it's perhaps it's the nat natural periodicity of my wanderlust. I've done a lot of little trips, like cross-country skiing or whatever, but these are the big trips. Yeah. So not very frequent, but when I go, they're very extensive. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Now, you know, my, my son and daughter-in-law uh, hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, and uh, that was very well planned out. Uh, our house served as sort of the mail depot uh, for all these packages they had already figured out. You know, there it's it's typically three to seven days is sort of the number of days you're on the trail between stops and, and stop in these little towns and you can receive packages there at the post office, et cetera. So they did like a year of planning before they embarked on on their Pacific Crest Trail hike uh starting in, in the border of the United States and Mexico and heading north. Uh, how, how, what kind of level of planning went into this for you guys? The, um, there was a lot, really. My, my wife is very meticulous. I'm organization man. You know, I, I just thrive on organization, and, and I'm disciplined, and so is she. We're, we're similar in that respect, and I don't know how we could have done it otherwise. She's, she's good at anything to do with computers and numbers. <clears throat> and um, we, um, <clears throat> well, for example, <clears throat> one of the major questions in the saltwater portion of this trip is, is when we can get refuge, when we can get out of the sea. Because this boat is not a comfortable platform to live aboard or sleep aboard when you're in the open ocean. It, it's rocks. It's a little flat bottom boat that just rocks and you can never rest so you you want to get out and so you that that means either uh, the lee of an island or a bay or a river mouth or a harbor and so we kept a um an excel spreadsheet of our findings of those things using maps and google earth and we would study them minutiously zooming in and and note the direction uh that they would not be safe in wind-wise in the direction they would be safe in wind-wise and all these different variables the latitude and longitude and so forth so that's an example of planning ahead we had to we know we have to get to a certain spot and and the difficulty one of the difficulties is that there sometimes there is no such spot um that day you, you have to go overnight and the overnight passages are really to be taken seriously this is not a boat this is this is stretching it using the boat this way but you know what we what we did was um just sort of what you could do with with that boat and we had to stretch it in some ways you know it was a little bit too small for the oceanic parts of it but a little too big for the portaging parts of it <laughs> yeah. and i haven't mentioned yet how those happened there these portages were sometimes very short just to get around a dam but the longest one was about 300 miles and they cost as much as five hundred dollars that had to be just arranged on the spot by talking around the town of people who have pickup trucks or a car with a trailer or um most of use trailers and, and pickup trucks sometimes some cases we put the truck on top of a car which it is light enough that with five men say you can do that um and um but those were all, then there's dams we had to find out about the, the, whether they open or not and so forth. So some of the planning you can do in advance and other things you really can't. You just um, figure it out as you go along. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you know, some parts of the world are very welcoming to people showing up in a boat or, you know, through some other means and other places are less welcoming. How did you sort of figure that stuff out? Everything was really good. The, um, the people, I can't think of a single place where the people were unfriendly, very friendly, of course, towards us, and we're doing something unusual, and they, these are people living in a little, to them, uninteresting, un isolated community. Anybody going through would be interesting to them, and we certainly were interesting, so we had a lot of good friendships. Um, Government-wise, there was some variability, um, so the, the paperwork was more difficult in some countries than others. Um, Venezuela was the worst. 
Um, and Nicaragua wasn't too good. Argentina had its drawbacks. <laughs> yeah, so is there a bigger story there that you'd like to share? Oh, well, Argentina, Argentina is very different from Venezuela. I, I mentioned them in the same breath, but uh, Venezuela was sort of actively hostile because Hugo Chavez was the president and he is very anti-American. And he forced that view upon his bureaucrats to take that line towards it. Um, Argentina, they're a, well, Argentina has this group called the Prefectura Naval. That's kind of like a Coast Guard, but it's more like a police department on the water. And they were like uh, busybodies. They were mother hens. They were... <laughs> They were just bugging us and wanting us to check with, check in with them every five minutes. And for every hour of navigation to do two hours of paperwork, they just they just had nothing to do. They had these big offices all up and down the river, and each one of them demanded our time to sit with their lawyers and drop more papers and more papers and more papers. <laughs> and maybe we could get to go out on our boat sometimes, too. Well, And then they told us it was just too dangerous. We just can't go there. Those places, like... They're just, it's certain deaths, you know, you go to a certain reservoir and it's like the, the land of, of no return, you know, and they're just, it's all just imaginary. They, they themselves didn't even, had even been there probably. Yeah. Yeah. Well, interesting. Very interesting. Uh, so as you reflect back on this, well, let, let's take a, before I do that, let's just take a quick uh, thing about your book. So then, then you have a couple books, but the most the recent one is the the five year voyage, which is the chronicling this trip that we've talked about. Um, and where can someone get that book? Is it available on Amazon? Yes, it is available on Amazon or any distribution channel. Yeah, excellent. You should be able to get it at any bookstore. It has a subtitle. It's the five year voyage, exploring Latin American coasts and rivers. Yeah, I will make sure that information is in the show notes. And now you have a, a, a book that you wrote earlier, and uh, tell us about that one. Okay. The Three Years on a 12-Foot Boat came out in 2000 in the first edition, and it has been substantially rewritten to a new edition. And these two books, that is the second edition of my first book and my new book, are being released simultaneously. Uh, April 5th, 2022. And just give us a, a brief synopsis of, of your first book, which is Three Years in a 12-Foot Boat. So what, what is that story about? Okay, in Three Years on a 12-Foot Boat, it's a boat that I designed and built myself. It's much smaller. It, it weighs only 250 pounds, which, so that I can drag it up the beach by myself. A major factor, you know. And whereas the five-year voyage boat, we could not drag it up the beach by itself. They had all, the two boats had a lot of similarities, but that's the main difference. The, the five-year voyage, because it had to be big enough for two people, could not be light enough to drag it up the beach. Um, three years on a 12-foot boat was a similar route in a way. Um, it was partly on rivers. That is, it began on the, well, a little stream called the Milk River, which flows through Alberta, Canada joins the Missouri, which joins the Mississippi. And then from the mouth of the Mississippi, I worked as a seaman aboard a freighter that dropped me off in Panama with my boat. I went through the Panama Canal and south along the Pacific and Columbia coast on the Pacific side, the Pacific coast of Panama and Columbia. Then I um, portaged across the Andes Mountains in a person's car and another guy's pickup truck got into a river called the Meta, tributary of the Orinoco, came to the mouth of the Orinoco and sailed the Eastern Caribbean islands, Dominican Republic around its south side, Haiti, Cuba along its north side to get to Florida. That was the end of that trip. So wow. it, was, it was solo and much, in a, way, in a way similar, but way different. That book, I was by myself, therefore lonely, and every, the emotional pitch is higher. You know, mm -hmm. uh, whereas when I'm with Jenny, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm satisfied emotionally. Yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> so um, 
I want to wrap this up. We've been chatting for 35 minutes. So what, uh, are there any things I, sh- I have not asked you that uh, I should have asked you? No, I think you've been pretty thorough. Okay, great. So one last question then. So, you know, a lot of people think about adventures, all, whether, whether it be, you know, a small two-day adventure or a, a massive adventure like, like you've done. Um, what, what sort of advice can you give people who, who are thinking about those types of things? Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm currently involved in a little writing exercise. I don't know if this answers your question, but it, it has something to do with it. And that's that for my Facebook friends, I'm, I'm writing in installments the story of my first travel when I, when I was 18 years old. Um, the funniest things, the most unbelievable things happen to me so that each of them begins with a little headline that you have to say, well, that's obviously just um, a, turn of, a, a turn of phrase. It can't be a literally true thing, but they are all a literally true thing. Crazy that that voyage was, I mean, that travel. For example, that I, that I ate in a restaurant made out of sticks. Well, I did, I ate in a restaurant made out of sticks and so on. And um, that has turned into a chapter by chapter or installment by installment uh, writing for the first time of my travel when I was 18. And so I guess advice would be to see when you're really young is when, when the wilderness can influence you the most or the travel, the, the foreign nature. See, wilderness and foreign lands are the same thing. That's that it's new it's not your turf you're you're in you're in somebody else's or you're someplace else you're you're very observant because you have to be to survive and when you're young is when you're of course you know learning more adaptable you're you're more impressionable you're not set in your ways you're you're less inhibited and you're more the 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 travel has a greater impact on you so I, i encourage people to travel when they're young yeah Excellent. Well, that's great advice. Well, Stephen, it's been a real pleasure chatting with you uh, and learning about your adventure. Uh, You've been a great guest. Thank you very much for being on the podcast. All right. I really appreciate it, too. It was fun talking to you, Ben. Wow. Bela, amazing interview. And, you know, to me, this minimalist approach, right, just with the backpacking stove and no outboard for the first part of the journey and things like this was really amazing. And the motivation that he had and his wife had were to me just breathtaking. You know, you're a veteran sailor. To me, all of this is new. You're a veteran sailor. What did you take away from Stephen's adventure? Uh, it's just just remarkable. I mean, I, I just can't envision doing something like this. And, you know, I, I think of uh, Stephen and, and people who do these adventures these days, uh, and I would say these minimalist adventures, not the adventures where you pay $100,000 and some some people take you up to the top of Mount Everest and back, right? But sort of the Stevens, the grassroots sort of adventure. You know, they're the true adventurers and explorers, I think, of today. And if you believe in reincarnation, you know, then in a previous life, they must have been on the ships with the Vikings or with Magellan or Columbus, right? These are the people who explore the, uh, the unexplored parts of the world. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to sail around the world today. A lot of people do it. Uh, but in my mind, what, you know, Stephen and his wife did is just remarkable, and you have to think about it in terms of, you know, they, they didn't have a lot of the technology that enables us to do all of these marvelous things that we have the ability to do today. So uh, just, a, just a great sort of adventure. I was really impressed. And uh, it's, I'm thankful for people who do these things because they're, they're great stories and they're, they're stories and, and this exploration gene that I think we've been sort of losing as, as we've evolved as human beings we have to make sure that exploration gene is still there. Cool. Totally agree. Yeah. You know, Steve and his wife, Ginny, they chose not to have inexpensive, readily available tools on their trip, like cell phones, social media. You know, they had the one exception of the VHF radio. They, uh, you know, they stopped at internet cafes every few weeks and things like this. So it wasn't like they were totally out of touch, but they actively chose not to have some of the tools that you or I take for granted and would have. Could you imagine even going, let's say, 
two weeks or three weeks without any of these tools? No, we we become so dependent upon all of these things. And, you know, if you really think about it, Mike, like my parents, you know, who were born in the 1920s, they didn't have all of this stuff, right? And 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 all the years before, all the people who came before them. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years as, as human beings, we've been able to live without all of these things that we today think are absolutely critical. And, you know, you think about it, th- those folks were the true explorers. Even if you think about the United States, like think about things like the gold rush, where people went in wagons and horses across the country, right? I dread driving across the country at 60 miles an hour. These people did it on a horse or they walked, right? So they're the true explorers. And I think, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, this technology enables, right? The technology that I have on my sailboat, the GPS, the, the radios, you know, all, the motor, all of these other things, right? They enable ordinary folks like you and I to do things that we would have never dreamed about doing 50 or 75 years ago, all right? So that's what technology does. It enables the more ordinary people to sort of, at least for a week or so, you know, think they're explorers <laughs> when we're really not. Um, and, you know, you can sail across the ocean. A lot of people do it these days on sailboats. It's, it's not that big of a deal. But you, you take away their GPS, you take away their weather forecasting, you take away, away you know, their, their wind generators and all the electricity they have on the boat, et cetera, and all of a sudden it's a different ballgame. So I, I just think, you know, if you think about it, this technology not only lets people sail across the oceans, but, you know, if you're relatively fit, you can, you can go to a, an outfit and they'll take you up top of Mount Everest or even – even more so, you can go into outer space now. I mean, holy smokes, right? You got enough money. Yep. If you got enough money, you can do that. So that's all because of technology. And uh, so I, I think there's good side of this and there's a not so good side of this. Um, I think sometimes we get too dependent upon it. And then when something happens, uh, we're, you know, we're in big trouble. Um, and because we don't know how to cope without it. But um, I just I just look at Steve and, and I just say, wow, what a remarkable trip and what a remarkable adventure and going to places that you wouldn't think about going with a sailboat. <laughs> right. Wow. It's, it's not like, OK, he sailed up and down the coast of some remote part of South America. No, he he went to the interior yep. and they had to portage the boat across land a couple times. Yep. Right. And he figured out how to connect these rivers up so he could sort of go up one river and down the other and end up in, in, in different countries. Just remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, and yeah, just the willingness of Steve and Ginny, uh, Steven and Ginny to do this without, um, without these tools was to me an incredible commitment. And yeah, what an amazing thing. They relied on themselves and there were challenging moments and challenging days and weeks, but, uh, but really an, an amazing story about the ability of humans to, um, to master a scary world. Uh, you know, again, without a lot of these tools. Now, I have a couple other questions. So I'm interested in the differences about kind of boating the way you sail on your boat and using one of these ultralight minimalist boats that Steven used. That's question one. Question two is what's the difference between freshwater and saltwater sailing? And then question three is this whole thing about having the baby on the boat blew my mind and you know i have no kids no pets right and you got little grandkids and your boys you raised them boating how well do boats and kids mix so three questions sorry i gave them to you all at one time all right well i'll try to i'll try to remember them Uh, so the first question about small sailboats if if you look at most of the competitive sailors you know people who sail in the olympics or people who sail competitively, they all started on a small boat. And that's because a small boat is very sensitive to wind, to the currents, and to weight. And that's how you learn how to really sail a boat efficiently and effectively, which if you're doing it, you're trying to get to point A from point A to point B as fast as you can, it's important to know those things. A big boat is much more sluggish. It's, you know, you get a puff of wind, a big boat, maybe you barely even feel it. But in a small boat, man, you have, you, you're going to feel it and you need to react to it really quickly. 
So there's a lot of advantages, I think, to learning on a small boat. Uh, they're often called dinghies. So there's dinghy sailors. And if you look at colleges, that's how the colleges compete, right? At the, at the collegiate level, the, all the sailboat races are in dinghies. Uh, so I think it's an important place. Uh, his boat is a little bit bigger than a dinghy, but not that much bigger, bigger. So for example, our first boat we had was a Catalina 22, a 22 foot boat, similar in length to what, what Stephen had. And, uh, you know, now I have a much bigger boat, a 45 foot boat. And, you know, that little Catalina was really sensitive to little puffs of wind. And I, I could really feel everything very, my, my senses were filled all the time. And, and uh, I could feel the pressure on the tiller. I could feel the pressure on the lines and when the wind would come. Uh, on the big boat, it's a little little less, I'm, I'm more numb. I feel, I feel like I'm a little more numb to what's going on. And which means I probably need to hone my senses, right? So, so clearly people know how to do that because they can make boats like mine and bigger go fast, uh, but they have to hone those senses in sort of a different way. So that's the big boat, little boat thing. Interesting. Uh, let's see. Question number two was... Saltwater uh, versus freshwater. Oh, saltwater and freshwater. I mean, from a sailing perspective, there's not much difference. I can't think of any. It has to do more with how close are you to land, how deep is the water, right? Freshwater, if you're on a lake, you're not going to get really big waves. You'll On a lake, the waves tend to be smaller, but closer together and steeper. Whereas in the ocean, you get these big rolling waves, right? Much bigger, but their amplitude is bigger, but the, the frequency is, is lower, okay. if you think about it in engineering terms, right? On a lake, the frequency is higher, but the amplitude is smaller. Okay. Um, so, so there's really no, no difference that I think of. I, I, maybe there are, but I, I, just, I just don't know, know what they are. And the tides, if you're on a river and a tidal, right, the tides come in and out up to a certain point and then they lose their influence, right? So you That's might right. be sailing in the, near the headwaters, you know, and there's and it's salt water and it acts like the ocean a little more and then it just gradually kind of tails off. Is that how that works? And the farther away from the ocean you get, at some point it's, it's freshwater and the plants change and the fish change and now it's like smaller sailing, yeah? That, that, that's exactly right. So I grew up uh, on various different parts of the Hudson River. And, you know, you go to the Hudson River down in New York City, and it's really salty. <laughs> I mean, it's the ocean, and there's pretty big tides. And the tides come all the way up to Troy, New York, which is uh, about 150 miles, I think, 100 miles, north of, 100 miles north of New York City. So the tides come all the way up to that way. But the water's fresh, mm-hmm. right? So, um, yes, they make that transition along the way so on these rivers that drain into the ocean. Yeah. Right. And if you live there like yeah. you so, do, you know it, right? But if you don't, you really got to make right. sure you've got that local knowledge, right, to know what's going on. Right. So like in the Hudson River, right, you have the current of the river and then you have the current generated by the tides. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they're going in the same direction and sometimes they're going in opposite directions. And so you really can get some speed, real right? funky things going on. <laughs> Right, depending upon where you are. Fascinating. Never really then, thought about that, but it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it. I mean, and there's certainly tides in the ocean and currents. I mean, there's people often think about tidal currents as only being close to shore, and I guess that's correct if it's a tidal current. But the ocean itself is full of currents all over the place. I mean, there's the Gulf Stream that goes, you know, four to five knots from Florida almost all the way up to to Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's just remarkable. So there are these like rivers in the oceans that you can sort of take advantage of or stay away from, depending upon which direction you're going in. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And those are all well mapped out. They're well understood. I mean, you know, they've been around a long time. They may meander a little bit, but uh, people understand where those various different currents are and the directions they flow in. Yeah. But in in the river, you got to know the local, right? Kind of the local story, right? There's always what's called local knowledge. So in the marine industry or the boating industry, there's like local knowledge that you want to know about. There's, people write books about that, right? So in this part of the Chesapeake Bay, you have to worry about these things, right? right? Or this part of uh, Long Island Sound, you have to worry about these things. Right. So but in South America, right? In South America, it's a whole different ballgame, right? It's not there, the Chesapeake. There are no game. books. There, right. There are no books, and there's not even a lot of peas in some of the areas. Some were normal That's size right. cities, right? But some were really these. Right, That's these, right. Yeah, fairly and where low Stephen density. Went, 
situation. Right. Where Stephen went, there were no books. Yep. Right. You you got to sort of get on shore and ask the other person who's got a boat if you can find one. Yeah. And communicate with <laughs> right? them. Right. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Last question was about kids third... in boats. Kids. Yeah. Fascinating to me. So I mean, kids. I, the thing I'm amazed with kids, and and, and I. I guess, you know, I have, we have two sons. They're all older now. Their oldest one is 40. The other one's 37. They have kids now. And, and it's really having grandkids brought this into clearer focus for me than when I had our own kids. Kids are really adaptable. Gosh, are they adaptable, <laughs> right? And, and they can do all sorts of stuff. They can tolerate much more than most adults can tolerate. And, and they're really amazing. And, you know, there are several YouTube channels out there that recently had children, you know, a younger couple, they sold everything, they bought a boat, they sailed around the world or wherever for a few years, and now they had a, a baby and they're still sailing. And and so it's it's great insight into uh you know, it's it's the only world the kid knows. So so for them, this is home, this is what I do. Here's the places it's okay for me to go. Here's the places it's not okay for me to go. It's just like in a house, right? There's places you don't let your kid go because they can get hurt. No different on a boat. Um, if it's a small boat, I, I think three people on a really small boat gets much more challenging as Stephen had to deal with. But I think kids are the, probably much kids are more adaptable than adults. Let me just leave it at that. Interesting. Well, and it'll be exciting to as we kind of go forward with uh, this podcast, right? As your granddaughters get older, right? To hear how they get involved and what they're interested in. And um, and I think that'd be kind of cool. So, yeah. What do you yeah. think? Time to wrap it up? Yeah, let's wrap this one up, Mike. Great. Well, Bela, thanks for bringing Stephen on the podcast. It was really amazing to hear firsthand about his and Ginny's adventures. Uh, and it is a really good read. Uh, for anybody interested in sailing or Latin America or both in my case. Um, but listeners, thanks for joining us for another episode uh, for, in this case, um, sailing and cruising Latin America with starting on the East Coast. You were right, Bela. They started in the Keys. But um, we hope that you enjoyed it. If you have questions about what we've discussed today or you have suggestions for guests, please feel free to get in touch with us. Our email is sailing the east. That's all one word smushed together at gmail.com. Yeah. So thanks for listening. And if you enjoyed the podcast, please hit that follow button on your podcasting application. And if you know of someone that would be a good guest, uh, reach out to us and let us know and we'll invite them to be on the show. You know, spring and warmer weather is around the corner. And I think by the time this episode gets released, uh, if everything goes well, paradox will be in the water. So currently she's uncovered and uh, she's not in the water yet, but I think by the time we get this one out there, uh, she'll be in the water and uh, I'll be starting the sailing season. So until next time, signing off from upstate New York. See you soon. Sounds good, Bela, from over here in a warm and sunny Munster, Germany. Uh, looking forward to seeing you next time.